The theme of uh, this session is the impact of transdisciplinary science on agriculture and farming. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Bronwyn Harsh from, uh, uh, Bronwyn's from uh, uh, the uh, QUT, Queensland University of Technology. Um, I had the privilege of working with her for a while at CSIRO and realized uh, what a star she is, uh, not only in her, uh, in her own discipline, but actually as a strategic thinker um, and to a large extent looking towards where the field is going to move to over the next 10 years. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Bronwyn here. She's traveled uh, uh, quite a long distance uh, and uh, she'd be forgiven for being bleary-eyed, but I know she's had a half decent sleep. Um, she is the uh, director of the Institute uh, um, for Future, sorry, Institute Future Environments, I'm so sorry, yeah, the Institute for Future Environments at QUT. Uh, she's also on the Prime Minister's Advisory Council for Science and Technology in Australia. Um, so wields quite a lot of influence over there, but she's going to wow us this afternoon by looking um, quite far ahead as to what farming might look like over the next 10 to 15 years. Bronwyn, it's a pleasure to have you here. No pressure, Morris. Uh, so uh, I am with you for the next hour in your after lunch session. So it is a delight to be here. And um, I'm really proud that I'm um, able to be part of the advisory committee, the science committee for PERC as well. I, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a whole heap of collaborators that I work with. Um, this is a work of a huge transdisciplinary team where transdisciplinary is we're trying to solve industry's problem by putting away our disciplinary baggage but trying to solve the problem that industry or government has. And so there's a major group of people that work with me on these endeavours as they relate to agriculture. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge Tristan Perez, whose uh, Twitter handle I've put up there as well. So in terms of where I'd like to take you for the next 50 minutes or so is tell you a little bit about my background because I think for a lot of the students in the room there might be some interesting points for you to pick up as I speak about this. Uh, speak about the drivers around digital agriculture and what that actually means for those that are wondering what it means. Uh, what's the nat uh, national response in Australia? We've been doing work on how do we get ready for this, um, uh, this phenomena. And I'll speak a little bit about a major national initiative in a cooperative research centre that we're calling Food Agility. And you'll get to see why the agility word is really important for digital agriculture. The next is what's the university's contribution for digital agriculture? So I'll speak a little bit about what transdisciplinary practice is. And you've already noticed my definition is different than multidisciplinary, I'm trying to expand your minds from multi to trans. Um, it's a nuance, but it's important in terms of the people that hand out the money um, in government and the, those in the universities that then hand it on to you and how industry uh, interacts. Then I'll speak a little bit, because I, I should, about digital agriculture at QUT and some work we've been doing with state government in the state that I'm in around future workforce and working with them on getting ready for future workforce for digital agriculture. And uh, also there will be uh, opportunities for you to switch off a little bit when I'm playing some videos about some of the research that we've been doing with our partnerships. So I've got some videos to show you as well. Hopefully that'll all work. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a farmer's daughter. And my parents are uh, in Australia, one of the largest brassica growers in Australia, actually. Uh, but uh, as people that know how to manage risk and mother nature, there's other things they grow besides brassicas. They grow lucerne, potatoes, onions, lucerne hay uh, as well. So that, that refining fire for me of growing up in that context was understanding for mum and dad, mum and dad, 
to run that business was the business knowledge they needed, the risk management the need they needed, the data they had in their head, and that they got out of bed each morning was amazing. So that, that has really refined for me the importance of all those different elements in them running a business. So that's at the forefront of a lot of the work that we're doing um, in digital agriculture as well, putting that end user first. But also, with that in mind, I was nudged off to university because I was supposed to have an easier life than my folks. And so I was motivated by the industry problem, but it was the 80s in Australia, and we were told none of us were going to get a job um, when you were coming out of school and going into university. So a lot of us hedged our bets, but it ended up being the best thing that we could do because we're quite... At the moment, when I go to parties, I'm not sure am I... I'm actually trained as a data scientist, so I'm a statistician. So I'm not sure, should I introduce myself as a statistician? Uh, my main degree was a joint degree in environmental science as well, so sometimes I call myself an environmental scientist. Uh, but my PhD was actually in um, looking at big data analytics in germplasm screening with uh, groundnut breeders. And it was working with groundnut breeders in Queensland as well as in India. Uh, so it depends which audience I'm of how I introduce myself, and I think that's really cool that I can cross those different boundaries and connect to people in different ways. So there's sort of a learning there, I think, for those that are going through the education system at the moment as well, is how not they, people talk about T-shaped people, where you have a disciplinary depth that you learn at university, and then you have the T-bar that helps you think about your kind of skills of working in teams and how you communicate, but I'd expand that to thinking about being a key-shaped person where you're also thinking about the context in which your work's being done with industry and government. So key-shaped people. So I'll move on to now a little bit more and um, with the Science Advisory Committee where we've been interacting with the different disciplines involved, this is a special shout out uh, in terms of I realise some of the, the joy and the pain you have when you're trying to do multidisciplinary research. Morris mentioned I spent a fair bit of time in CSRO, uh, 18 years. So I joined there as a postdoc in a biometrics unit. So I was there to serve all. Um, as it relates to uh, in agriculture. It's actually in the same city that Peter's from, from Adelaide. And you can see the morphing of the names of the institute that I was actually in, which actually shows you what was going on in, uh, the, in that general informatics area of mathematics and statistics, and you had to change it to information science, then you put informatics in it. Then I, I um, had a period where instead of working alongside people, and um, responding to their needs, I wanted to be in the driver's seat because I felt that what agriculture needed was a lot more of people stepping up and leading on the informatics agenda. And that's what PERC is trying to do, um, as well as GIFS, the Global Institute as well, giving each person uh, uh, and the different disciplines a, a chance to shine as it relates to agriculture. Then having spent some time in agriculture, I needed to go back to my people and make sure they were connecting in a way that was really, imp uh, really going to get their um, ideas up and funded. So if you work with CSRO at the moment, um, it's called Data 61, that particular unit now. So I was the chief of that division before I left to go to QUT. And at QUT, as Morris mentioned, I run an institute for future environments. I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but it's over across many of the important sectors in Queensland and Australia. The other thing that I'm also doing is uh, uh, I'm the research director of the Food Agility CRC, a cooperative across universities and industry, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And the other perspective is where you can... Um, I'm really passionate about working in other sectors, uh, so I don't... Maybe I'm a little lazy, but you get to work with other sectors and bring their ideas into what you're doing um, as well. And so Morris mentioned that um, I'm working uh, for the government on the National Innovation and Science Agenda. How do we make sure we get the balance between discovery, applied and commercial research right? And how do we incentivise industry to actually invest in research through... R&D tax credits and things like that. 
But I also work um, with the Department of Environment and Heritage in Queensland and assist the Great Barrier Reef Foundation on how to preserve that great asset for the globe. I also work with the Australian Government's National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy um, and also PERC. So those different dimensions, I think, make it really rich for the kind of interactions um, that I really enjoy. So back to digital agriculture. So what are the drivers for digital agriculture? And, and these are ubiquitous across the globe. It's around intensification that's happening. We're wanting to see high inefficiency in the value chain from the farm gate through to the consumer, whether it's a consumer of food or fibre. Uh, others have mentioned population growth and habits and the change in protein demand, where protein not only has to come from cows, but also from pulses and lentils, go lentils. Um, the limited land use for ag, um, the cost and availability of inputs, ever increasing and ever complex as well. And also uh, consumer concerns around safety, pollution and provenance. That's certainly something that Australia makes sure, uh, our, our clean green credentials, making sure we keep those intact. So they're the drivers uh, for digital ag. Now McKinsey and company have done a few studies in a couple of different countries around uh, what they're calling the Australian Industry Digitisation Index. And then I'll show you the, U the American one and see if you can see a difference. And it's about digital readiness um, of different sectors. So the idea here is for you to see the colours. Um, so it talks about digital readiness as it relates to digital assets that sectors have, the usage of those digital assets and the kind of labour uh, in, in digital and at the top are the knowledge intensive industries, professional services, finance, admin services. I'm in the middle, there's the service industries, arts and recreation, wholesale, rentals. Then at the bottom are the asset intensive industries and at the very bottom, what a surprise, agriculture. So above agriculture is transport, warehousing, construction, utility, mining. So there's a fair bit to go for the sector as been assessed in terms of its digital readiness. So let's see how different the American Industry Digitisation Index is. Um, and uh, right at the very bottom is agriculture and hunting. But the, the pattern is the same, knowledge intensive, service intensive, uh, asset intensive. So a lot of the things that uh, we're finding when we're doing uh, discussions with the ag industry is the same with mining and construction and infrastructure. So for all the uh, computing scientists out there and engineers, um, you can uh, uh, be thinking about the platform technologies that you build. You can deploy it in all those different industries and say so work smart um, and, not, and not hard. So that's, that's sort of the context of uh, wh why there's so much uh, opportunity in the digital arena for agriculture. In, in Australia, um, I, I didn't uh, go through what was happening in Canada, uh, apologies. I expect it's the same, it's just the numbers are a bit different. Uh, the opportunities there you can see in ag tech are huge. It is one of the hottest things going at the moment, ag tech. And I know in Australia there's a huge interest in a lot of European companies in particular um, coming in to deliver uh, ag tech services and work with our SME industry to build it up. What's really important around digital ag is that ecosystem between the multinationals um, and the SME sector that will end up delivering the services. There's a lot of job potential of course and I'll speak more about the kinds of jobs um, and the skills, and, and of course, productivity and sustainability. So digital agriculture isn't just about the tech, of course. Uh, so there has been the machinery and GPS we've seen through precision ag, connectivity and integration, the sensor, sensor networks and robotics and the telecom infrastructure. Australia's got, still got a little bit to go on getting the broadband out to the bush. I'll speak about that in a minute. But that generally was around precision agriculture, that kind of tech. 
So what's come in, what's really important in the research that's happening in digital agriculture is thinking about human factors, society and economics and the business model innovation that digital brings in. That's what we've seen with Uber and Airbnb and all those places. It's actually data has enabled a whole new business model to be used. Uh, so that will be important in digital agriculture, already is really. And then the other dimensions that uh, come in around digital agriculture, importantly, um, it's hard to get representations right in a slide, but in the middle there, of course, the important context and why I've put the fabric of the orange around it is the agriculture value chain and environmental knowledge. Of course, that's critical for digital agriculture. And importantly, the informatics and cybernetics is how you pull this stuff all together for enhanced decision making. So we've seen everyone's talking about the Internet of Things and Industry 4.0 and that's what informatics and cybernetics is trying to bring together with the former um, area around precision agriculture, making sure that we go from the ag and ag engineering to precision farming that's connected, that's knowledge based uh, in, in a systems context. And people are talking about Industry 5.0 already, where it's a lot more about um, autonomous systems assisting um, in tasks. But I won't talk about Industry 5.0 today. So what changes will digital ag bring? Uh, we need it to improve our situational awareness, the intelligence from the sensing, very important important in terms of the context of what we've been hearing about plant breeders and phenotyping is one of the areas. I'm informed decision making, particularly for production, but importantly, the digital signal through the value chain. And so I'll talk more about that with the CRC concept. Better and easier compliance with regulation, access to new markets and creation of new business models, and efficiency through automation and autonomy. So I know there's a standout here of one of uh, the industry collaborators which is definitely showing that efficiency. So the key challenge uh, in this is the transformation of the information and decision making workflows. So we've already seen a few of these today already, the horrendogram workflow of how do you simplify that uh, through the workflow systems that, for example, a plant breeder has, but for any end user in agriculture, whether it's the farmer, whether it's the processor of meat, it's the processor of the vegetables, or the retailer receiving those goods. Um, someone else sort of used the same context of this. I think, James, it was you that spoke about this, that for some, you speak to some of the end users along the value chain, they're not sure what happens in the middle. It's some kind of magic. Um, so I want to just speak a little bit about the way we're engaging with industry, all industries, not agriculture, about what are the workflows you need to think about. You need to be aware of them to really get that uh, improvement from the digital transformation. So the information and decision-making value chain. So if we start um, at the very at the very top, it's about making sure you do take time to design for data generation and capture. We've seen a fair bit of that today already. How do you communicate that around in terms of the common systems? Uh, Non-trivial. Um, integration of data and modelling. How do you store, discover it, communicate it? Then how do you move through to the insights and understanding that you need? And then importantly, where the rubber hits the road, the decision making under uncertainty. And then in implementing that within the workflow and tracking the change of it and going around. So a lot of the, the digital context of what uh, the Internet of Things, enhanced data, faster data, more data, more uh, variety of data is in that context of a workflow. Um, so it was it Kirsten that was the previous speaker? I can't see her in the crowd there. But oh, there we are. Um, she was making the, the plea for, in this workflow, where are you going to help me, effectively? Um, and so that's what all the different folks are thinking about in terms of um, their digital story. Where, which part of this is it going to help? So in terms of thinking about 
uh, informatics and cybernetics in particular, you're thinking about these things on the bottom part of the wheel with cyber security, internet of things, cloud, big data, the comms and the infrastructure. How do you get that digital information through to analytics, which is creating new business models and new products and services. Uh, so there's a lot of um, interaction between uh, folks from business schools, from law and creative industries around social media in terms of bringing through new business model innovations and products and services to, uh, to industry. So everything does converge a lot on analytics when it comes to the digital economy and that's what's fueling the growth in digital ag sector. And I think the, the uh, workshop that we're having on Thursday around um, the, the data provenance and those kind of issues is very pertinent here. And so, of course, uh, in this kind of context, uh, whether you're your government, your industry, or you're a research organisation, a university, you have to think about the capability that's relevant here. And PERC has been thinking about that, of how it brings the capability together, about infrastructure that you require, whether you have it yourself or your collaborators have it. But most importantly, it's your networks um, that these two things enable as well, both within your local context and then your national and international context. So what I'll move on to now, we've sort of done the drivers, made the case. Um, and for the students out there, I want to really, there's one thing that I've learned um, through my career is making your case. I mentioned that I was working with plant breeders nationally and internationally, ground nut uh, breeders. And it was, I had to make a case for, maybe there's a different way of how you were doing the phenotyping and stuff in the field. And, you know, you want to be respectful, they're the breeder. Um, but there's the point in that dialogue where it switches, where they are open to your ideas, where you've earned their respect. So making a case. So the reason I tell that story is making a case uh, for your place in the sun, your research area, your contribution is really important. And so what I want to give you now is an example where nationally we made a case to the government about um, uh, this initiative of food agility. And the idea of food agility is it's we need to use agile science methods to, to deliver to industry. That's what they're asking us for. We can't wait three years or six years. There's a different mode that we require you to deliver with us on. And so for us within the research organisations, we have to think differently about how we're partnering with industry to get these things out there because it's the major adoption barrier that they're seeing, that they're saying to us. The other agility piece is to enable industry and government to be agile because of the information they're getting about their sector and where they can move. So this is the part of the case um, that we made to federal government. So Food Agility CRC, Cooperative Research Centre, is about empowering Australia's agri-food industry. And this is part of a discussion that I'm having with Morris at the moment about how to link through um, to gifts effectively. So we're trying to look at growing that comparative advantage through uh, digital information. So we want to assist create this $100 billion food industry and it's about bridging between agri-food and digital. In Australia, of course, agri-food, we've been very innovative. When it comes to digital technology uptake as a society, we're right up there. But the context, as I gave before, that digital maturity dance isn't there. So this CRC is to bridge that. So there's some quotes um, here from folks that are assisting us make the case. Um, if you're involved in Australian agriculture, Mick Keogh um, is a juggernaut and he speaks about the food sector not being prepared for a digital future. It's already being left behind. We need this initiative to catalyse a more competitive industry. Um, in Australia, we have industry growth centres that set the direction for major industry involvement in a research. And the CEO there off says that this offers the opportunity to share things and collaborate in a way that hasn't happened before. That's one of the reasons that this, the sector isn't doing well. It needs to learn to collaborate better. And then from KPMG, uh, government has one of the biggest agriculture and food production data lakes and will definitely benefit from digital insights. So this is the focus of the Cooperative Research Centre for major impacts. And notice they're not research headings, 
the impacts that government of industry have said they want us to deliver on. So there's the demand drivers and then the supply drivers. So the produce the right thing is when you're getting market signal nationally and globally, how do you get that information back to the value chain to an urban or a rural producer? How do you let that data connectiveness occur that people can get those signals so people are producing the right thing? The second is around leveraging brand Australia. I mentioned clean green. How do you use data assets to be act to able to show provenance? How do you use blockchain, for example, um, for our um, high-grade beef into China? And there's a lot there around the uh, not only the provenance but around regulation as well. How do we cut the red tape around a lot of the regulation that's required because of the data inventories we will have. On the supply side, uh, access to finance. Um, some of our main investors here are, is National Australia Bank, which is Australia's biggest bank giving uh, finance through to the agribusiness sector, and also the Insurance Australia Group. So they're interested in, if we're doing a better job of data collection at the right sc temporal spatial scale, we can uh, help uh, the end users through the value chain manage their risks better so we'll give them different financial incentives through the products we provide to them. And build future workforce, this is more than the PhD program in the CRC but it's an important part. Uh, we'll also have work integrated learning at undergraduate level and also master classes in corporate professional education for those in government and in industry, small and large. So the main, some of the main funders here, we had to find, um, the government gave us 50 million and we raised 160 million from industry for a 10 year initiative, so 210 million. And uh, the main partners are Bosch, Microsoft, Intel, uh, National Australian Bank, Insurance Australia Group, Australia's biggest livestock company, the Australian Ag Company. Uh, some of the main suppliers to the retailers and then major uh, farmer production groups um, and uh, fish markets and a lot of SMEs as well. So it's about in here with the partnerships, it's having mechanisms for the big and small players to come together. So I'll speak about how we're going to try and do that apart from using chocolate. Uh, so what I want to show now is one of our partners um, telling their story um, as it relates to digital agriculture. Twenty-five years ago we didn't have the technology that we've got now. To work out how much water I had to put on the crop, I got a drum and a tape measure and I measured the evaporation that came off during the day and that way I could estimate the volume to put on for the crop. Well, I'm a bit of a techie, so bringing data analytics into the farming arena, I get really excited. Each year we lose about 200 tonnes of lettuce to water-related issues. We believe with the yield, we can reduce that by 30%, saving the company hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. We'll be able to turn that data into useful information that we can use in the field in real time. They're one of our partners, and so in that in the program of work, so we haven't formally started yet, we're doing all the contracts up with the feds, but uh, QUT uh, with a ag service provider, the yield, um, is working with Houston Farms around their, the sensing uh, and the analytics. So the yield provides them with a service of their watering schedule. So they don't put in the sensors, they don't do the analytics, but that ag tech team, the yield, provides that for them. So that's sort of an example of um, what we're trying to do. So the principles around the centre here is what an industry is driven uh, this, it hasn't been um, just the universities, and there are there's seven universities um, involved in this um, as well. And interestingly, in the Australian context, it's not the, we, call, we talk about the sandstone unis, the ones that have been there for a very long time. Um, they're not the ones that are in this bit, it's the technology universities that are leading this. So it's been an interesting journey um, in that context as well. 
So we want to put the users first. We're about putting data into circulation. So that'll be very, the discussion that you're having tomorrow is one that uh, we've been having as well. I mentioned agile data science and learning by doing. So I'll speak a little bit about what that actually means. So our partners do span uh, the value chain. Uh, regulated, we have each of the state governments um, involved as well as the federal government. Uh, as uh, the fellow from KPMG mentioned about all those data lakes out there in, in state and federal government. So data in circulation, um, and you'll speak a lot more about this, no, it's Thursday, isn't it, not tomorrow, about the many different data silos and tombs um, that relate. Uh, it's a lot of the information across the value chain. How do we open that in a way that's respectful um, and adds value? Um, there's, uh, there are some phenomena where uh, there is a generational um, dimension around privacy as well that I think would be interesting to see how that plays out of how important privacy is um, in the next 20 to 30 years, depending on the service that you get back from giving that data, which we do on a daily basis with our iPhones. Making agile science real through business, a different business model for impact. So this is what industry spoke to us about in terms of how they wanted to interact with us um, as a university and research um, ecosystem. The customer with the business problem, the technology and service provider, and then the research provider. Often it was only between a customer with the business problem and the research provider. There wasn't the translation into a commercialised system that was going to be robust. So that's been built in that each, each project will have those three elements in it. And so, of course, the research providers have generally been okay with engagement. Um, it's making sure the data and technology that's being developed by the SMEs and the major players are being linked in, not always pushed out. Uh, a lot of reinventing of the wheel that goes on and then making sure digital research outcomes go back to the technology providers from the research organisations and delivering the digital solutions. So the model is different um, in this particular context than most cooperative research centres in Australia have had. The important feature of how um, we're looking at actually running the projects, I think, is, is an important dimension to think about. And here it's a concept we're calling Design Central. Uh, for some of you in, your, in the university, um, it's in your humanities area, usually this capability is in, in design-led thinking. We like to call it design-led doing. Uh, where it's about a hyper-engagement model in terms of how to actually uh, develop projects together, where the diverse capabilities and perspectives from researchers and others in, in the industry come together to design these projects together. So there's three main activities that our, we'll have a kind of lab that's called Design Central in each of the universities. So it will be about the design-led projects, but we'll also do strategic road mapping for the different sectors as well, addressing the, that um, digital maturity within the uh, different sectors. We're looking at that same kind of heat map, doing that for the different verticals within the Australian ag sector so we can work with them on how they can improve it as overall as an industry as well. Importantly, the community challenges events, the local mayors, the food groups, like the kind of market will go to Wednesday afternoon, they're really keen to see how they can contribute to this and learn through it as well. So there's a, a lot of challenge kind of events that we'll bring together. Uh, people with market stores, of course, can be digitally enabled in terms of knowing how much food and what food to take for their market store, depending on weather and previous patterns from their stores. So there's, there's a lot that they're interested in this as well. So the research programs um, I mentioned are across uh, the top there. They're the columns of the matrix and there's three research programs that we have. And I wanted to give you a flavour uh, for this in terms of the different kind of capability we're drawing on. The underpinning infrastructure and technologies in digital agri-food technologies, uh, we're looking at sensing platforms, robust IoT infrastructure and certified food uh, certified food systems data as well, 
And so here the capabilities that we're drawing on, not only from the universities but industry as well, recognising they've got a lot of capability here, is around data acquisition and transmission, IoT comms, security and privacy, mobile sensing, autonomous systems, computer vision, scheduling and management of data intensive workflows and computer human interaction. So there are some of the main capabilities we'll put together with deployment experience of these digital technologies. So we're not trying to invent new technologies, it's deploying the ones that are out there now. Uh, Agri-food informatics builds on that. Um, you've got the data, what's the decision making that you're going to be doing? And so here the main capabilities are the very many different variants of the analytics that you need to do with that data. So from data science, comp modelling, optimisation, statistical design, AI, machine learning. But importantly, the unstructured data, uh, often folks in this room would be used to structured data, biogeophysical kind of data. Um, in this context, the social analytics text mining is going to be very important as it relates to consumer experience. Uh, then the user experience, visualisation and visual analytics um, is going to be important too. Uh, vis virtual reality and augmented reality experiences will be important for the delivery of some of these technologies. Now when I was seeing photos before of people working through fields um, is uh, maybe there's wearables, uh, maybe there's new contact lenses that has virtual reality out the front, maybe they're the next technologies that we need for some of the things that are happening uh, in your context. And the third program, Sustainable Food Systems, this is where uh, uh, our business, law and regulation uh, colleagues are really important is thinking around food governance and sociology. Around workforce, it's about organisational culture and workforce development, community engagement and economic, the econometrics, the ag economics kind of area, innovation policy, uh, regulation reform, and uh, as well as the legal, social and ethical impact of digital technologies. So you can see from a capability point of view, um, it's a pretty rich space uh, for, for everyone across the research domains to be engaging in. Uh, so we're developing up projects at the moment in that context of Design Central. So some of the projects we're working on uh, is with Combeef, which is a meat processing company, working with a company out of London that developed the blockchain for diamonds in relation to blockchain development on uh, their meat packaging into Japan. Um, we're working with the Chinese quarantine service as well around uh, blockchain as relates to meat into to the Chinese uh, context. Um, we're working with our wine industry, because I know you all drink Australian wine. Um, and again, it's around provenance issues of their rootstock. Uh, there's the Houston's and other companies like that. Um, Mulgawi Farming Company that supplies most of the brassica um, and beans into our retailers. One of their pain points is getting the information from the to the re, to getting their stuff to the retailer, um, and so there's a lot of information and data demands that they have as a supplier that's making them very inefficient and turning into. They talk about their data farmers rather than farmers at the moment. It's very inefficient. So how can we help them with that that data data flow information flow? So that's, I'll leave you with that in terms of if you want more information um, about that initiative. And so, Morris, that was, the, as promised, I'd give you that kind of pitch in terms of what uh, you're thinking about with your colleagues as well. So we'll move now on to the universe, a university kind of contribution to this. I think, Morris, I'm still going okay? Yep. And I wanted to uh, cover off on three different dimensions. And there will be that blatant ad around um, what QUT is doing in this context. So transdisciplinary practice. So I mentioned that um, I'm the executive director of this Institute for Future Environments. And uh, what its goal is about is knowledge, technology and practices around sustainable security and resilience, bringing the natural, built and digital together, recognising the, it's the converging environments that these interact with that are, are the most difficult things. But importantly, we need to bring in the social, cultural and economic context um, for what we're trying to do in, in this work. 
So globally, we want to be renowned. We want to say, others say we're a delight to deal with. We don't want to say it. And we want to catalyse. We don't necessarily have to do everything, but we're very um, passionate about making sure we're catalysing things for government and industry on how they're dealing with problems. Um, I mentioned transdisciplinary collaboration and what that definition is around end user need and responding to that. You bring your discipline with you, but you don't say, I've got something that can deal with that. You actually listen to the actual problem at hand. Um, we're doing a lot um, with um, building the entrepreneurial spirit of our researchers, our students and our researchers, and providing them with opportunities to take their ideas outside the university or partnered with the university as well. Uh, I've put STEAM there because we're bringing together not only the STEM disciplines but the humanity art and arts as well. Most of society's problems are about people and their interaction with the issue, so that's a very passionate point for us. So the Institute has these st three strategic actions around transdisciplinary research and innovation, and I'll tell you about the focus of that, about infrastructure, and transdisciplinary research, culture and sustainability. In this kind of context, there's a different kind of culture and incentivisation you need um, in those contexts. So here around research, we're thinking about the right challenge, the right scale and a delight-filled partnership. And uh, delight-filled partnerships being at the heart of what we want industry and government to say about them working with us. For our infrastructure and facility, it's recognising people within the facilities need to be client focused, they need to be empowering users um, and also they, we need to get a return on the investment of those, felicit, those facilities. And in a transdisciplinary endeavour, people need to be clear about their role for collaboration. What is your role in a project team or a major uh, endeavour? That people are motivated by impact and that uh, how do we invest in teams working together? So might, for some of you there um, who haven't managed major portfolios of research, that may seem a little odd, but in terms of how you make it clear for everyone how you're investing, it's very important how, how the dollars get handed out. So the focus um, of the Institute is across these areas. So the one that I've spoken about mainly on digital agriculture is growing the global bioeconomy. We do work on managing for resilient landscapes. Uh, infrastructure for sustainable communities around smart precincts in particular. I'm um, embracing the digital age is a major focus, how we work with small and large and governments to enhance their digital maturity. And then the enabling platforms recognises they're sector agnostic and we build the, the research in a different way, uh, advanced materials, intelligence from sensing and transforming innovation systems. And there's numbers of different facilities we have to support that uh, as well. So the, the, the major ones are the Central Analytic Research Facility, Visualisation and E-Research, Research Engineering as well, the Autonomous Systems, Big Data Analytics, Visualisation, AR occurs, and then particular precincts where we can do the, the dirty, dull and dangerous stuff um, when we're blowing up buildings and burning buildings and... Uh, doing biofermentation and stuff like that. And they're based with our uh, industry partners. Uh, so an important part of this transdisciplinary endeavour as well is the coaches that support the researchers. So we have knowledge to innovation brokers or business development staff, the comms and engagement, project delivery, and actually tracking our excellence and impact as well. Um, there, there's actually, I do research on the research of doing impact, and so it's a researchable issue itself of how you plan for impact. Um, so I've actually got a postdoc working with me comparing um, uh, what an institute in a university does around checking impact, um, what our national lab CSIRO is doing, and we're, we're looking at one of our joint partners um, in agriculture actually about how they track impact as a major multinational. So that trust, transparency and team is really important on building that research to innovation uh, pipeline. And the way the, the faculty staff sit within disciplines, the columns there, they sit within faculties, 
um, so they're employed by the faculties and I bring in the, bring in the money, bring in the projects and ideas um, through the institute. So that's the, the operational model of it. So in terms of these different modes, I, I know from sharing some of the uh, activities with the theme leaders um, for PERC that I thought this might be interesting um, to underline some of the points I've been making um, in relation to the different modes uh, around collaboration. And this often relates to your own maturity journey, where you're at, whether you're young in your journey or you're young in the relationship in terms of um, your research. So serial cooperation is um, in the context of, I wait for someone to give me data, I crunch some numbers and then I give it back. So there's a, there's a serial thing there. Parallel cooperation may be where you get to know each other a bit more and you're actually planning things together. And then there's entwined collaboration where you've actually sparked off each other and developed things in a whole different entwined kind of way. And that entwined collaboration um, is a lot more difficult. You need to make sure you've got two ears and one mouth when it comes to that kind of collaboration. But one, often people uh, approach transdisciplinary practice like a battlefield where they should think about it as an ecosystem. And so when it comes to um, how your research organisation or university, um, even within industry contexts, is how this is incentivised is really important to make sure it's not a battlefield but um, an ecosystem. So now I'll move through to the focus um, of, around our IntelliSensing area as it, as it relates um, to digital agriculture. So in, in digital agriculture, the capabilities that we draw on are across these different areas, across all the different faculties. So you notice there's a lot of dot points before you get to the agricultural systems area. Um, at QUT, we don't have an ag school. We partner with people within the industry for that. We do have some ag systems people, but our strength is on technology and technology enablement. Uh, and these are some of the uh, companies that we've been working with. We've been working in this area for around th three years, so it's relatively new. And you see the research sponsors that we have there. We have um, the Rural Development uh, Corporations in Australia. Um, the Queensland Government and some SMEs there, and our research partners. So you can see that there, there's a number there um, from New Zealand, the big lab in uh, Australia, CSRO, as well as Bosch. So they're, they're the direct partnerships that we have at the moment. And these are the kinds of projects that we're working on in the digital ag area. Uh, so the, the first one um, that we're working on um, that you saw the video about was data analytics for app technology in irrigation decisions. We've just been working with uh, the rural industries R&D corporation, that's across all the rural sectors, where we're using unstructured analytics and data mining to look at predicting opportunities for Australian agriculture. So the kinds of things we've been working with uh, them there on is these technology trends where you don't have to get all the experts in the room, actually use the web and grey literature and text mining to come up with what the kind of the priorities are. So the things that we've been speaking to them about is digital twins, and uh, so that's about dynamic software models that represent a physical asset or a process. We've been looking at low power, wide area networks to get out to rural areas where there isn't a cellular network. The human machine interfaces that are conversational and wearable. Um, solar retransmission, where there's retransmission from satellites on frequency bands that are optimal for photosynthesis. And also personal analytics through wearables and these smart contact lenses. So we're working with the rural industries to make sure they're aware of technology trends as well. Um, what I wanted to show you now is a video around our robotics program and one part of that, which is our AgBot, um, and I'll let the video um, speak for it, really.
A solar-charged, battery-powered robot is changing the way Queensland farmers tackle weeds, showing increasing resistance to common herbicides. Using state-of-the-art cameras, the AgBot detects, classifies and exterminates all on its own. It looks like it should be scanning for signs of life on Mars. But this rover is on a mission to destroy at a Bundaberg farm. The AgBot 2 can find and kill weeds without humans having to lift a finger. This being a prototype, there's still a bit of work to do, but I'm very, um, I, I think this is the way of the future. Designed to work autonomously, AgBot decides how it will exterminate the weed. It can use a chemical agent, a thermal method, or its mechanical plough. The machine's developers hope this will reduce the cost of physical labour while tackling the threat of herbicide-resistant weeds. The robot can run with the batteries for about eight hours and then comes into the port, docks automatically and then recharges the batteries um, using solar energy. It's no Terminator, but the amount of money this robot could save the farming sector is truly intimidating. $1.3 billion a year. The state government has already invested $3 million into AgBot. With a $70,000 price tag, it's now investigating how the weed killer can become commercially viable. New technology is uh, brought to us constantly and uh, we follow the changes as they go. Just imagine what AgBot 3 will do. Dominic Hansdale, ABC News. So in the design of that particular egg bot, it's very light. Um, we actually had aerospace engineers that had been working with Boeing uh, work with us on that actual design. But the main commercialisation aspect we're working on is actually the, com the computer vision algorithms, of course. I don't know if Carl's out there. Um, and so we're, look, we're working particularly with the cotton industry and their service providers on taking that out as a service provision where uh, the cotton farmers are looking for weeding as a service. How it is provided is up to the service provider. So we're working with that to commercialise things there. Um, I'll skip this next one. Uh, this is especially put in for Morris because Morris was with us in London at an AgTech event and saw these numbers and thought I should put them up. Um, and so we did, and we've done numerous trials on, on AgBot in, in very different uh, circumstances. And here it's interesting to see um, these trials that go through from AgBot using batteries on board on the, on the left to the diesel use to using a, a sprayer um, with spot spraying um, to um, uh, doing um, broad um, spraying and you can actually see um, what the actual cost differential is and the potential. So ag box have got the potential to um, reduce the costs by 90%. So if you want to know more about um, that particular um, area of work, Tristan Perez is leading the, uh, that work. Some other projects then here relate to, and I won't show this video, um, is around robotic harvesting um, in the horticultural sector. We've been working there with sweet peppers or capsicums, um, also using autonomous uh, weed scouting, as well as working with the cotton industry on their decision workflows and what is the data they need um, to be doing their decision making processes. I'll try and skip past that. Now, in terms of growing the global bioeconomy in general, uh, we have a focus on tropical crops and biocommodities. And so in Queensland, pulses is an industry that we're helping the government to actually uh, enhance. So I'll have to make sure I connect up with you, Kirsten, in terms of what uh, we're doing there. But sugarcane is um, after cows. Uh, sugarcane is um, the largest um, ag commodity out of Queensland. And we're also doing a lot in, the, in biorefining and bioproducts in that area too. So, Morris, could I have a, another five minutes or so to... Is that three? Yep, yeah, okay. So I'll skip through this, um, and these slides will be available, but I'll just give you the kind of context of what we're working with state government on around skilling up uh, the future workforce. So the, and there's a report available on this. So it's thinking through ag jobs across production, the allied industry support service and the value chain. 
And what this graph shows you is that the majority of the workers are, are workers and farmers. And uh, what we have to look at is these different parts of the workforce and the education sector, including research. And so the analysis that we've done has looked at the different roles of professionals and what are the emerging skill needs and changes and what will actually happen with those kinds of jobs. So I won't go through the, the detail there because I want to remain friends with uh, Morris. I think here the interesting thing, this is what uh, we're seeing that what autonomous systems will take away um, from jobs, but we're seeing that the, it'll be a different kind of jobs that people will be doing. And importantly for researchers, and I think um, James was re referring to this as well, with these other different digital skills, data-driven models, analytics, cybernetics, robotics, machine learning and AI, it, it's creating new capabilities in researchers, but it's also creating new capabilities that we need in our infrastructure as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you.